During the 18th century, smallpox was a leading cause of death. The disease is caused by infections with the variola virus and most people became infected during their lifetimes. The philosopher Voltaire reported that at this time 60% of the population got infected with the variola virus and 20% died of it. Edward Jenner was an English scientist who, like many other people, occupied himself with the disease. For many years he heard tales about dairy maids who became resistant against smallpox after being infected with cowpox. Compared to smallpox, cowpox is not very fatal for human beings. He concluded that cowpox does protect from smallpox and can be transmitted from one person to another. In 1796 he decided to conduct a dangerous experiment. He acquired cowpox lesions from a dairy maid and inoculated an 8 year old boy. This boy developed mild fever over the next few days but became quickly healthy again. Jenner inoculated the boy again but this time not with cowpox lesions but with smallpox lesions. And surprisingly the boy didn't develop any disease. This is the story how Jenner developed the principle of vaccination and today he is often called the father of immunology. With his discovery Jenner saved numerous lives and since then various vaccinations have been developed. But what if we can not only use vaccination to eradicate pathogens but also to kill tumors? My name is Kevin Steinek and today we talk about another form of immunotherapy, cancer vaccination. Before we start this episode I want to remind you that this is the third part of our series immunotherapy. So make sure to check out the other videos here and here in order to keep up with this episode. In the last years immunotherapies have revolutionized cancer therapy and we've already discussed three subcategories, immunostimulation, checkpoint inhibitors and CAR T cells. Today we talk about the fourth class of immunotherapy, cancer vaccination. In order to understand cancer vaccinations we first need to find out how infections normally occur in the body. If a pathogen ends up in our body it provokes responses from the innate and the adaptive immune system. There are several cell types involved in these two immune systems but today we exclusively focus on the adaptive immune system. The adaptive immune system mainly consists of B cells and T cells which recognize a variety of different pathogenic proteins or antigens. Once B cells or T cells recognize a pathogen they undergo clonal proliferation meaning they divide rapidly. Through this mechanism we now quickly get a lot of cells which can recognize and kill the pathogen. While most of these active cells die shortly after the infection some remain and become memory cells. And these memory cells are now ready to be activated once the body encounters the same pathogen. The amazing fact about memory cells is that they sometimes remain inside our body throughout our whole lives. For example in 1781 there was a severe measles epidemic on the Faroe Islands and many inhabitants died. In 1846 another measles outbreak took place on the same islands. This time almost all inhabitants died except for the 98 survivors of the first epidemic. During vaccination we want to generate such memory cells. This means that we want to expose the body to certain components of bacteria or viruses. However vaccinations are different from infections as no intact pathogens infiltrate the body. As a consequence we trick the immune system to produce memory cells without having any harmful infections. Ok so how does this work? Vaccines are composed of antigens and adjuvants. While antigens are proteins which are normally present on the surface of the pathogen, adjuvants are components which induce inflammation. Through both components the immune system is stimulated and memory B cells and T cells are generated. Imagine now we vaccinate people against this evil pathogen here choosing antigens on its surface. If the same pathogen now infiltrates the bodies of these vaccinated people late in life the immune systems are already primed and ready to fight off the intruder. And now we come to cancer vaccines. We have two main approaches to reduce the number of cancer cases using vaccines. We can vaccinate people against viruses which might provoke cancer or we can vaccinate cancer patients to enable the immune system to kill directly cancer cells. Vaccines against viruses which are associated with human cancers are very similar to conventional vaccines. If we vaccinate people they should be able to fight off these viruses thereby decreasing the prevalence of certain cancer types. Well this idea is already put into practice. Many strains of the human papillomavirus or HPV can provoke cancers of the uterine cervix. Since HPV is mainly transmitted through sexual contact we can say that cervical cancer is often provoked by sexually acquired infections. Therefore women and men should be vaccinated against HPV. 
In the UK, HPV vaccinations are now routinely offered to girls aged 12 to 13. However, next school year, boys will also become eligible to be vaccinated against HPV to prevent future transmissions. Okay, so we can vaccinate people against viruses which provoke certain cancer types. This makes sense, right? But what if I told you, we can also vaccinate cancer patients directly against tumor cells? And now, we come to the fascinating part. As most of you know, cells have to undergo extensive mutations in their DNA to become cancer cells. For these mutations, cancer cells acquire certain characteristics which stimulate their growth and enable their unlimited proliferation. What is astonishing about our immune system is that it has the natural ability to find these cancer cells and kill them. In this regard, two cell types are especially important, natural killer cells and T cells. Both of these cell types have the ability to recognize stress or abnormalities in cells. Stress means a few mutations, cells start to exhibit abnormal peptides in their MHC1 molecules or they do not show any MHC molecules at all. As you might remember from a previous episode, cytotoxic T cells check the status of body cells through MHC1 TCR interactions. If cancer cells undergo certain mutations and do not show any MHC1 molecules anymore, they cannot be found by T cells. However, in this case, natural killer cells come into play and they deplete the cells. This means that without our intact immune system, most of us will develop cancer in a very short period of time. However, sometimes cancer cells can evade the immune system through different mechanisms, such as secreting factors which inhibit the activity of immune cells. In this manner, cancer can develop over time. Given that we can develop vaccines against proteins which are normally not found in body, we can teach the immune system to recognize abnormal proteins on the surface of cancer cells. Okay, so what are these abnormal proteins? Sometimes we find proteins in cancer cells which are highly overregulated or which are only found during early development normally. In other cases, we find mutated versions of proteins on the surface of cancer cells, which are called neoantigens. Neoantigens are produced by cancer-specific DNA mutations and therefore they have a unique sequence. If cancer cells now sufficiently present such proteins to the immune system, we can develop an effective vaccine. In the last years, we've started quite a few different clinical trials based on cancer vaccination. Unfortunately, many initial attempts were compromised by a poor understanding of immunization. In most cases, dendritic cells, which are not a very important component to recognize antigens, were not stimulated. Once this has been recognized, dendritic cells were also stimulated, which then led to better results and more frequent responses in advanced melanoma patients. And then in 2010, Provenge was approved by the FDA as the first cancer vaccine for advanced prostate cancer patients. In this case, dendritic cells are taken from the patient and then they are exposed to prostatic acid phosphatase and GMCSF. For this treatment, dendritic cells are activated and then they are reintroduced into the body of patients where they provoke immune responses. In a clinical trial, this cancer vaccine led to a four-month increase in overall survival. Of course, this increase in overall survival is rather moderate and therefore the cancer vaccine has yet to be optimized. Moreover, treatments with Provenge are very expensive. In another study, a vaccine was combined with two other compounds to treat breast cancer patients. These two compounds are named cyclophosphamide and trastuzumab, and the clinical benefit, meaning partial or complete responses, at one year was 40%. Cancer vaccines are a very complex field of research and the area of immunotherapy has just started. Therefore, many questions remain in the combination of adjuvants and antigens and how we deliver the vaccine to the patient. Moreover, high costs also hinder the establishment of cancer vaccines. If we develop cancer vaccines against new antigens, for example, we have to tailor our treatment for each patient. And this, of course, means that our vaccine might work on one patient, but not on the next one with the same cancer type. But I hope that this video showed you a fascinating field of research with much potential. And before we stop this video, I want to celebrate with you guys because last week we just hit 100 subscribers. I don't have any script now or something like that. I just want to thank you guys. Your support really means a lot to me and it's awesome to get feedback on my videos. And it's also funny to me to see that I know some of you from my hometown in Vienna or from a time I spent in UK or from Germany. And I've met others of you online and now that we are all together on this channel. And I really want to thank you guys for commenting or engaging in any way on my channel. And I'm really happy that you're here. And with that, <laughs> I'll see ya.